said in your word, wherever there is two or more gathered in your name, you're in the midst. We thank you for being so merciful and so kind to us. And we welcome you to our assembly this day. Guide our worship services, O oh God. Bless us to season our words as we render praises unto you. May you direct our prayers, our giving, our praise to you, O oh God. And we thank you for blessing our families. We pray that we do everything according to your holy divine word, decently and in order. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's our rock, in a him we hide, a shelter in the time, secure whatever you be tied, secure whatever you be tied. A shelter in the time so you know my Jesus is a rock in a weary land oh Lord a weary land oh Lord a oh my Jesus is a rock in a weary land a shelter in the time a shade by day defense by night a shade by day defense by night he's a shelter no fears along the poles of fire. No fears along the poles of fire. He's a shelter in the time of storm. Don't you know my Jesus is a rock in a weary land? Oh Lord, a weary land. Oh, we, oh my Jesus is a rock. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock defend. Oh, Matthew, he's a shelter in the time. He's thou a helper ever near me. He's a shelter in the time. Don't you know my Jesus is a rock in a weary land? Oh, Lord, a weary land. We, oh, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of God will make a way for oh, where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for you and me. My God, hold me closely to his side. Oh, with love and strength, for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Say, God, make a way where the seems to be no way. He works in way we cannot see. He will make a way for you and me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to His side. Say with a love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because.
Because it's given Jesus Christ His Son Give thanks With a grateful heart Give thanks To the Holy One Give thanks Because He's given Jesus Christ His Son And now Let me Say I am strong Let the poor Let the poor say I am rich Because of what Jehovah Jireh has done And now Let the weak Say I am strong Let the poor Let the poor say I am rich Because of what The Lord has done For your thanks Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Give thanks. You say give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Take the time to glorify the Lord. The time to glorify and the Lord. You wanna take the time to glorify and the Lord today. Say, just take the time to glorify and the Lord. You wanna take the time out of your busy day. Glorify the Lord today. And hey, we sing now for we take. Is a day of Thanksgiving. You know, my God, He's been so good. He's been on every day. day. He's blessing me every, every day. day. Is a day of Thanksgiving. You ought to take the time to glorify. Just take the time. Oh, you ought to take the time to glorify. Today. The door, he the door that I might see He's blessing me. He keeps blessing me, blessing me. You know it. Blessing me. Hey, just take the time to glorify. You ought to take the time to glorify. You ought to take the time. Just take the time. As we continue our service, please bow with me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge the church as your beloved bride, and we submit our lives to you for your divine guidance. We understand your desire to lead your people. We ask that your word be clearly and faithfully proclaimed in our church, and that through it we would be challenged, encouraged, and changed. We ask you to protect our minister and leaders and keep them from temptation, complacency, and idolatry. We ask that our church would be filled always with joy as we sing your praises each time we gather together. Fill our prayers with confidence in your mighty power, and may we be kept filled with your Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. We have come to the portion of our service where we 
take our communion. And that is the taking of the broken body and the shedded blood. And we thank God at this time for allowing his son to come down from heaven on our behalf that we may have everlasting life through his great sacrifice. And we do this by taking of the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread. And we'll take the unleavened bread at this time. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you so much for allowing your son to come down from heaven to die on our behalf for the remission of our sins. We take this unleavened bread in remembrance of him and his great sacrifice. Let us all say amen. You may take the bread. And also we take the fruit of the vine, which is the shedded blood. Let us bow at this time and give thanks for the shedded blood. Father God, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which is the shedded blood of our Lord and Savior, that we take it also in remembrance of him. Let us all together say amen. <laughs>
We now prepare to worship God through giving. Just as in communion, our giving involves two kinds of response. The first response is acknowledgement of the income that God provides for us to meet our daily needs. This is called tithing. By faith, we return to him a just representation of our regular income, which is called the tithe. Let's pray for the tithe. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us in our giving and through this form of giving uh, to support the ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Our second response is an acknowledgement of God's graciousness toward us. Your offering is, exp is an expression of gratitude for what God has done for you that you did not expect. When we give an offering, you're saying, thank you, Lord, for the special blessing that you bestowed upon me this week. And I return to you this token of thanksgiving for that blessing. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we cheerfully bring our offerings in acknowledgement of your abounding grace toward us this week. And we ask that you bless these offerings that are given cheerfully and out of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give my life to Christ.
welcome you again to an online service of the Reseda Boulevard Church of Christ and another deposit that we're making in this special series that we have prepared uh, for helping you to go through this pandemic. As we've often said, there are two pandemics. One, the doctors are dealing with, and that is to find a cure for the COVID uh, virus. And then the second pandemic has to do with the responsibility of ministers of the gospel and teachers of the word to help people deal with the dis-ease associated with uh, going through crisis times when your world is impacted, your life is being turned upside down in every way possible. Uh, God wants your faith to work for you. He wants your life that has been given to you through Jesus Christ to be sustained. And he wanted you to be a witness. He wants you to be able to minister to others as well as witness to the faithfulness of God. That God, while it is dark all over the land, in that place in Gosham, uh, where the Israelites dwell, there was no darkness. God was still being God. And the church today is still being the church. And God is still, and, and Jesus Christ is still Lord of the church. And we want to, we want to share messages with you to help you to experience the victorious character of the faith that is given us through Jesus Christ. Now, the passage that we are dealing with today, uh, keep in mind the theme has to do with faith that works in difficult times. And what James is doing is uh, dealing with all the various stresses that a person can experience when going through a trial, when a person is going through a difficult moment. Notice also that trials are transitions in life. There are transitions where God moves a believer. When, when you go through a trial, you're actually going to be promoted. You're going to go from one level of your relationship to another. And that's the purpose of God allowing you to go through trial. Even the church is going from one level of ministry to another if we recognize what God is doing. Now, this is also a time for spiritual retreat. You need to understand that. God expects you during this time not to simply be idle and, and be hoovering and, and a Afraid, but God wants you to be spending this time cultivating your fellowship with him and your fellowship with others. That's the purpose of the ministry of reconciliation. God is, has been, you have been reconciled to God and you're being reconciled to others. Now, God wants you to utilize this as a period of spiritual growth. Now, this is why we come to the passage that we are dealing with in this message today, which is how faith helps us to control our speech. Now, that seems strange. You know, it seems kind of off the path, but it's not off the path because you're going to see the significance uh, that the scriptures attaches to how you uh, express yourself. That is your speech and your salvation, how your speech is related to your not only your salvation, but the process of of your sanctification. One of the best measures of your spiritual development is the measure that you can find in your words. How your words is a true indicator of your spiritual development. And that's why James uh, starts by saying, don't be deceived. Here's a passage that makes a very radical statement. And that is in James 1 verse 26. And he's going to come back in chapter three and give the nuts and bolts of this. But notice in verse chapter one and verse 23, he makes this statement. Uh, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, he says you are only fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Now, that's a very powerful statement. Uh, it's a very radical statement. But if you don't understand the principles, you know, that scriptures give us concerning the relationship between speech, salvation and sanctification, you know, then that then you're not going to understand what James is talking about. Now, James dismisses religion altogether when he pers when he says a person who do not have any control uh, of their speech, that is, their tongue is not tamed, has not been tamed. And we're going to explain uh, what that's all about. Now, I want you to read the text. We're not going to take the time to read through the 10, uh, through the 15 verses because we're going to be dealing with each one of those verses throughout this message. And we'll be reading those verses throughout this message. You take the time on the study guide, you know, to read that text as a prelude, you know, to this message. So notice what James is doing in 
uh, in these 15 verses. He's going to show you, uh, first of all, how faith helps us, how faith is necessary in terms of helping you to control what you say. And he begins with the warning, and I'll read that part. He begins with the warning to those who aspire to be teachers. He says, brothers and sisters, do, he said, do not be in a hurry to become a teacher in the church. He says, because we who teach will be judged by God with greater strictness. Now that ought to put the fear of God in every teacher's heart and every preacher's heart. It gives me a sense of reverence to know that as a preacher, God don't want me to be so uh, in a hurry to put myself for, forward as somebody who speaks on his behalf. I need to reverence that, you know, calling, you know, speaking on God's behalf. He said, because number one, you know, when you claim to represent what God says, you're going to be judged and held to a stricter standard. Now, notice, I, I want you to understand when you read this text, James is saying uh, two things. Number one, you need to know how to tame your tongue. You need to know uh, the resources that God gives you. You need to know how and why you need God's help in managing your mouth. He reveals how speech is related to your redemption and a true measure of your spiritual growth. You know, so we shape our words and then our words shape us. Now, the first thing that we're going to see in this text, which we're going to begin with now, and that is he gives you three powerful reasons why you need divine assistance when it comes to controlling uh, how you talk. You need divine assistance when it comes to controlling. Understand controlling how you talk is not a matter of human achievement. It's a divine accomplishment and you need God's help. You know, when it comes to controlling your speech and we're going to be talking about how, you know, to obtain that. But the first thing is he gives us three powerful reasons for this. And he gives two illustrations in each one of these reasons. Now, here's the first reason why you need God's help when it comes to controlling your speech is because your tongue directs where you are headed. Your tongue directs where you are headed. Your words have tremendous influence and control over your life. Do you not know if you want to know where a person is going to be in the next five years, all you need to do is listen to what they talk about the most. Our tongue is a small member of the body, but it possesses, according to, according to James, it possesses great power. And he's going to give two illustrations of parallel truth as it relates to this principle. The small things he's saying, simply saying small things can exert enormous control. First illustration, he says, is a bit, a small metal bit in a horse's mouth. You know, large, a large horse is controlled by a small bit in his mouth. Can you imagine a 95 pound jockey controlling a 2000 pound stallion with a small bit in his mouth. James says in chapter three, verse three, he says we can control very large horses by putting a small bit in their mouths. By controlling their mouth, we can turn the whole animal whatever direction we want it to go. You know what his point is? You know, that is the mouth. Control a person's mouth and you're controlling their direction. That's the principle. His point is this with the bit. In other words, with just a bit of a sentence, a bit of a phrase, a bit of a word, you can change the total direction of somebody's life. Friends, I, I, I know that you know, just first handedly, just encouragement as a small kid, uh, encouragement of people place me to where I am today, you know, in the ministry and pursuing, you know, being a minister of the gospel of Christ. So a small bit of word phrase, you know, can change the direction of a person's life. Here is the second illustration. Same point. A the direction of a giant ship is determined by a small rudder even against strong winds. Notice James 3 and verse 4. Verse 4 says, you know, he said, or take ships as an example. A tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn what, wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. Now, if you have ever been in California, you've visited the Queen Murray, you've seen the humongous nature of that ship, but you have also uh, come to understand in visiting that, that that ship was governed and is governed by a small rudder. You know, the point is this, our words are like a rudder. The rudder makes the ship turn. Your tongue is able to keep you on course or drive you far off course. 
And, you know, parents need to understand this because children at every age remain impressionable uh, to the words of their parents. Your words have tremendous influence on your children, regardless of how old they are. You are impressionable. What you say is impressionable to your children. Now, here's the point. The rudder makes the ship turn. Our words are the guidance system. This is what James is saying. He's saying your words is the guidance system. It's the steering wheel of your life. If you want to change, in other words, you if you are not satisfied with your direction, you need to start changing the way you talk. You know, that is you change your direction by changing uh, what you say. Sometimes it's best to say nothing rather than to gripe and complain. Notice what Proverbs says in, in chapter 13 and verse three. Solomon said those who are careful about what they say protect their own lives. But whoever speaks without thinking will be ruined. So you need to guard your words and you need help in terms of controlling your tongue. Why? Because your tongue is the steering wheel of your life. It determines your destiny. Here's the second reason given in this text, and that is my tongue can destroy what I have. Your tongue can destroy everything you have. Your tongue can destroy your life quicker than anything else. Uh, in your existence. Notice in James 3 and verse 5, the Bible says your tongue is a small thing, James says, but what enormous damage it can do just like a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Your tongue is also a dangerous fire. Now he gives two examples of this and the first thing is to imagine a forest you know, that is totally destroyed by one little spark. You know, it doesn't take much of an imagination if you live in California to know this because we're dealing with forest fires, you know, even as we speak. But notice he said the tongue can create the spark for mass destruction. If you were here in 2018, the California fires uh, destroyed more acreage than any fire uh, in the history of the state. California fires in, two, in 2018 destroyed over 1,600,000 acres of prime forest land. Uh, the largest in, the, in state history. And in particular, one fire, uh, the Mendocino fire in the Redwood Valley of Northern California, it burned more than 410,000 acres. You know, and the interesting thing about the Mendocino fire uh, in Mendocino County is that it was traced to a tiny spark from a hammer driving a metal stake, a spark that destroyed more than 410,000 acres of forest land. The point is, James is saying this, a careless camper can destroy an entire forest an entire national park, so can careless words destroy an entire life. You can destroy your entire life or somebody's life with gossip and rumors. There are people in, in this life that can be called verbal arsonists. Why? Because they use their words to set things on fire, just misguided words. People have, in other words, they, there are people who have let their lives, they have let their mouth destroy their careers. They have used their mouth to destroy their marriage, their reputation, the reputation of others. They, their mouth have been used to destroy friendships. And there are those who have even used their mouth to destroy churches. The point is, friends, you need uh, not be a verbal arsonist. You need to allow the Lord and seek God's help, you know, in controlling your words because your words can destroy everything you have. Interestingly, both fire and words under control can give warmth and light, but out of control, they can be devastating. And as a result, you can lose everything. Notice so Proverbs 18 and verse 21, you need to write this. It says you have to live with the consequences of everything you say. Now, I want you to know what James says in chapter three and verse six. You know, uh, the description that James gives in this verse is very significant. Notice he says, among all the parts of your body, your tongue is the one that causes the most wickedness and spreads evil everywhere. It can corrupt and ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing fire of destruction because it is set on fire by hell itself. God talks. Do you not know that God talks more about 
the sins of the mouth than any other form of sin. If, if I were to ask you what part, what parts of your body, you know, causes the most sin or sins the most, causes you to sin the most or brings the most same shame. Most of you would say, oh, my sexual parts. But let me tell you, not according to God's word, it's your mouth. You know, do you not know that the Bible speaks more of 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 verbal sins than it does uh, sexual sins. Let me give you just a short list of of sins of the mouth that we often sanitize. You know, we sanitize these sins, uh, sins such as backbiting, lying, threatening, cursing, deceiving, uh, boasting, ridicule, slander, uh, false witness, uh, hypocritical words, complaining, bitter words, uh, flattery. Yes, the Bible refers to flattery as a sin. Uh, fault finding, mocking, defaming, judging, filthy language, and gossiping. You know, the point is, uh, the Bible speaks more of these type of sins than any other category. Sins of the mouth, because they determine your life. They determine your destiny. They determine what you possess and what you're going to lose. Friends, notice, I want you to note the second thing about that text, you know, is not only uh, is is the sins of the mouth, you know, the most shameful. But notice the Bible teaches us that words create a chain reaction in this text. In other words, and history shows this, uh, the most wars, most of the wars that have been started in this, in this uh, world uh, was started by a few inflam inflammatory statements. Proverbs 21 and verse 23 says this, if you wanna stay out of trouble, he says, be careful what you say. Now the next illustration is very significant because what James is doing, he's gonna use zoo animals to illustrate the point of what, of what the tongue, of what language, uh, how powerful it is. Notice he says humanly, uh, to, to speak humanly, he said we're able to control all kinds of animals, but the tongue, he says, is humanly uncontrollable. Now, now that's, that's a very powerful statement. Notice in verses seven to eight, James says people can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. Now, what he's saying is, humanly speaking, your tongue is uncontrollable. It's, that is simply to say that human beings cannot effect in and of themselves character change. You cannot change who you are in and of yourself. That's why people often make the same resolutions every year, over and over again, because you cannot, you cannot change who you are. This is what this is the truth that Nicodemus relied upon when he says, how can a man be born again when he's old? And then Nicodemus was saying, can you teach an old dog new tricks? And the answer, the obvious rhetorical answer to that question is no. But and James is saying you cannot control your tongue. He's going to give you the reason for that. You know, people wonder, why is it I, I can't you know, control, you know, my speech? Why is it that I often say things that I don't intend? You know, the point is. Notice he says, because the tongue is un, it's an uncontrollable evil. It is wild. It needs taming. And then notice the second point. He says it is full of deadly poison. That is, you can you can literally assassinate people. You know, you can assassinate people's reputation, you know, by your tongue. Uh, now he's going to get to the the heart of this. Notice each point, you know, creates another step in the direction that this text is going. The first step is to say that you need God's help in controlling the tongue because it's going to determine your destiny. It's going to determine your direction. Your tongue determines your mouth, determines your your direction. The second step is you need to determine, you need God's help to uh, control your language because your tongue can destroy everything that you have. You have to understand it's like a fire, it's like a wild animal, you know, that that human beings can tame. But notice the tongue, he says, the human being cannot simply contain or control the tongue with willpower. Here's the third step. He said, because your tongue displays who you really are. That is, it reveals your real character, your true identity, not the character that you want people to think you are, but your tongue literally reveals who you really are. Your speech show how spiritually healthy or sick you really are. Notice 
uh, and, and notice the interesting thing that when you go into a doctor and he wants to evaluate, you know, your health, the first thing he tells you to do is stick out your tongue. In other words, he can look at your tongue and tell you just exactly how healthy you are. The point is, you put a thermometer in your mouth, you know, and in your mouth reveals what's really going on in all of you, in the rest of your body. It's going on. It, it indicates what's going on inside of you. And that's what uh, and, and, and that's an indication of how significant and central the mouth is. Speech is the speech also reveals, understand this, and this refers to converted or unconverted. Speech also reveals the measure of our spiritual consistency. Notice when you became a Christian, yes, you 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 received equipment, you have seen the ability to have control in terms of what you in terms of what you say, but notice there's progress in the development of that. Speech also reveals the measure of your spiritual inconsistency. James 3 verses 9 and 10 says this. We use our tongue to praise our Lord and Father, and then we use the same tongue to attack and curse other people who have been made in the same image of God. So blessing some and cursing others come out of the same mouth. He said, listen, brothers and sisters, this should never happen. The point is, our tongue, that is yours and mine, is an incredible contradiction. Sometimes I can say the most unloving, unloving words to the very people that I love. You know, the point is it your speech unveils your hypocrisies and every believer has hypocrisies. And what is hypocrisy? It is the gap between what you say or what you profess and what you practice. There's always going to be a distance, a gap between your profession of faith and your practice of that faith, because we are in the process of becoming. We are in the process of being and becoming what God has already declared us to be. So the point is there is going to be that hypocrisy and it's going to come out many times in your talk. And you need to ask your course, how do you talk about people that you disagree with? How do you how do you talk about people that you disagree with politically or that you are different from racially or that you're different from religiously? You know, friends, a lot of that, you know, you need to take a look at because it reveals certain things about you. Now, I want you to understand now. James is going to bring us to the source of the problem. Notice the source of the problem. You know, what makes us inconsistent in our speech. James 3, 11 and 15, he says this, can fresh water and bitter water come out of the same spring? No. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grape, a grape vine produce figs? No. Uh, and can, can you get fresh water out of a polluted well? How humbly you live, not how you talk, shows your wisdom. If you harbor bitterness or jealousy or self-centered bias in your heart, you shouldn't boast that you're wise. He said, you deny the truth to make yourself look better. That's not wisdom. He said, that's earthly, that's unspiritual, and it's inspired by the devil. In other words, what is the crux of this message, James? He said, here's the crux of the message. Whatever is in the well will come out in the water. That is, the well is your heart, your, your mouth, your speech, your tongue, you know, only gets its source, gets its resource from the well. And the well is the heart. And whatever is in the tree is going to come out in the fruit. So here's the point that James is making in this text. My deeper problem isn't my tongue. It's my heart. My mouth eventually portrays what I really am on the inside. And so when we recognize that it's about the heart and only God can change and only God can transform the heart. And if your heart has been not totally transformed, uh, uh, not being transformed the way God would have it to be, then you're going to be having problems controlling your words. Understand that you're going to be slipping this in, and you oh no, I didn't mean to say, yeah, 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 you did, because that's who you are. You know, your words could convey exactly who you are and you need to recognize that, acknowledge that, stop and stop deceiving yourself. Then what is the solution to the problem? You know, and uh, in as much as I cannot resolve this problem on my own, then what do I need to do? Here's here's what you need to do on a daily basis. Number one, cleanse your heart daily through prayer and confession. Notice in Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus says this, for out of the 
overflow of the heart, your mouth speaks. So by prayer, what you do by prayer, you ask him to help you manage your mouth. If you're a believer, do you not know that God can help you manage your mouth? He's already given you a transformed life. He's given you a transformed heart. He's given you a transformed character. Now you need to be asking him, Lord, help me manage my mouth. You know, notice Psalms 141 verse 3. Uh, the psalmist said, Lord, help me control my tongue and help me be careful about what I say. So the first thing is through prayer. The second thing in terms of cleansing your heart on a daily basis, you do that by confession. And that is you simply acknowledge sins of your life, sins of your thoughts. You know, whatever is in your heart, whatever is in your uh, mind that shouldn't be there, just acknowledge that to God. Notice in Ezekiel 1831, the prophet says, rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. That's what David said in Psalm 51. He said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. Confession is good for the soul because it cleanses your heart. And the more you cleanse your heart on a daily basis, confess your faults. If you're confessing your sins over and over again, you know, to the Lord as they enter into your life and enter into your heart, you confess that you're sweeping your heart and therefore you're maintaining, you know, you're maintaining or you're exercising speech control. Now notice also allow God, if necessary now, allow the Lord to give you a new heart. Sometimes some of us may simply need a heart transplant. That is, if you have never actually allowed your life to belong to the Lord, given your given your life to the Lord, you're going to need a heart transplant. And what may be symptoms of that? Let me tell you something. If you have a harsh tongue, you are revealing an angry heart. You may need a new heart. If you have a negative tongue, you may be you may be exhibiting a fearful heart. If you are, have an unfriendly tongue, you may be revealing a hard heart. If you have a critical tongue, a bitter heart. If you have a boasting tongue, an insecure heart. You have a judgmental tongue, a guilty heart. If you have a if, if you have a a, a profane tongue, a filthy tongue, an impure heart. You may need God. You may need to ask God to give you a new heart because God is in the heart transplant business. And that's that all the prophecies about the kingdom is about God giving people a new heart. Notice somebody with an encouraging tongue got a happy heart. If you have a gentle tongue, you have a loving heart. If you have a controlled tongue, you have a peaceful heart. Is that the kind of heart you want? Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to allow the Lord. You need to allow the Lord to do that for you. God is in the transplant business. And the, there are four steps to receiving a heart transplant. The first is to admit your need for one. You know, you have to admit it because God will give it to you if you admit it. You know, and then the second thing is to recognize that Jesus is the doctor. Jesus is the doctor that never lost a patient and he can give you that transplant. And when you accept Jesus, when you acknowledge Jesus as the one who's the deliverer, as the one who's the savior, do, you are you, that's called repentance. And then you have to acknowledge him as Lord, acknowledge his ability to do that. He's God in a human body and he can definitely give you a transplant. And that's confession of faith. I confess that Jesus is God's son. And then you have to be willing to act. If you're willing to act on his word, if you're willing to take that decision, make that decision to allow to receive what he's willing to give you. That's called being baptized for the remission of your sin, baptized to receive forgiveness, baptized to belong to his body, to be a member of his family. Friends, we ask you to do three things after every worship service. The first thing that we ask you to do is to. Uh, recognize, first of all, is to renew your commitment to God after every worship service. Just ask God to help you to appropriate these principles in your life and use them on a daily basis. The second thing is to acknowledge whatever you see God doing, you know, in your life that you did not expect. If God is blessing you with abundance, if God is showing you mercy, if God is giving you healing, whatever you see God giving you, acknowledge that with an offering to the Lord, because that's a show of thanksgiving. God didn't command you to do that. He expects you to do it, you know, in terms of your spiritual development. And the third thing that you need to do is take these principles, get in, get on a social media platform, invite others to discuss these principles with you. Bring other believers into your life, you know, and have fellowship, you know, cultivate your fellowship with others during this time of this pandemic. And God will bless you in a tremendous way. Will you bow with me as we go to God in prayer? Father, we, we are so grateful for 
all that you do for us. We're grateful, Father, for your word. We're grateful, Father, for these principles of spiritual measurement. Help us, God, as we retreat, you know, during this time that we will cultivate our relationship with you and we will utilize the principles of speech, uh, measure, measuring our speech, our words to know just how far we are in terms of our spiritual development. And Father, we pray that uh, if we need to make that, that step, if we need a new heart, that we will let those around us know that I'm willing to have a heart transplant. I'm willing to give my life to Jesus Christ, and I'm willing to make that decision now. And we ask this all in the name of him who loved us and died for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.